I had just moved halfway around the world to get my master's in international affairs at Tsinghua, China's top university. But I didn't care about international affairs. No, I was there for doors. You see, China is a tier one market, and I knew that the experience and connections I made there would open lots of doors. Up to that point in my career, everything had been about doors. Every job I took, every event I attended, every program I applied to was about how many doors it would open. And China was one big door. The first week of the program, I was sitting in my building's lobby. It was a lobby unlike any I had ever seen. And that lobby could only be entered through two beautiful doors. Each one must have been 20 feet tall, by five feet wide and heavy to the touch. It was like it had been carved from an oak tree and placed directly on the hinges of the building. As I studied their beauty, one of my classmates walked through those doors and changed my life forever. When he walked through, something was different. He stood a little bit taller. He held his chin up a tad bit higher, and he walked with a bit more swag in his step. I immediately spotted the reason why. These were all symptoms of a fresh haircut. <laughs> I studied and admired his perfection. The sides, they were blended seamlessly, and his hairline was so crisp that you might even have called it cold. <laughs> but I wasn't the only one that noticed. That evening at dinner, he was surrounded by black classmates who had to know exactly where he had been. We had to know where he had been because for black men, the barber shop is not just a place you go to get your hair cut. In a world where we are constantly facing prejudice, bias, and discrimination because of the color of our skin, the barber shop is a safe haven. It's a place where you can be, exist without the mental and emotional pressure of that reality. And the haircut, the haircut becomes the ultimate act of self-care. I made my appointment for the very next day, and after my last class, hopped on my bike and headed over. I had the butterflies associated with a first date. What if I didn't like him or he didn't like me? What if his shop was dirty or he messed up my hair? The questions were endless because I needed to find my barber shop. Carrying the weight of these expectations, I parked my bike and opened the front door. I was met by a row of Chinese women styling hair. Confused, I stopped and prepared to double check my address. But before I could, the frontmost stylist looked up and without saying a word, pointed to the back of the shop. She knew exactly why I was there. I maneuvered down the long, narrow shop and reached the end of the hallway and pulled back a curtain and saw the validation that I had needed. My new barber was finishing up another client. He had a straight razor in his hand and was zoomed in close. And with a touch so gentle so as to remove a single strand of hair, he gently edged his hairline. Next, he leaned back and placed two fingers on his temple and checked each side like an artist making sure his canvas was just perfect. I knew that I had found my barber. Over the next few months, I went to that barber shop at least once a week, sometimes twice, really any time I needed a moment of reprieve from the challenges of being both black and foreign in China. As I got closer with my barber, he said he wanted to expand and look to me for investment. I really believed in him and wanted the shop to exceed, so I weighed the pros and cons and I ran the numbers, but as much as I wanted to, I just couldn't do it. It wasn't a nice enough door. It wasn't prestigious or important enough to make anyone prestigious or important care. So I closed that door, leaving behind what mattered to me to continue pursuing what mattered more to others. Soon thereafter, COVID ended my time in China, and I ended up on a gaming team at a big tech company in Silicon Valley. 
It was a fast-growing and high-profile role that I knew was going to accelerate my career, where I could begin to access those far more prestigious stores that I was so desperate to achieve. But I didn't care about gaming or the company. And as I wrapped up my onboarding and met my new team, I had the same question that I had my first week in China. What am I doing here? Next, as I struggled to answer this question, everything would change on May 25th, 2020. I remember sitting at home and watching the video of George Floyd's murder over and over again. I couldn't help but think how powerless he must have felt to be slowly strangled to death while people watched and recorded as he called out for his mother. It made me question everything. And after weeks of reflection, I was left with one very simple question. Was I living for my resume or for my eulogy? I went for a run around downtown Oakland and happened to see one of my old barbers. It was the early days of the pandemic and all of the barber shops were closed, so he had the great idea to bring his shop to the street. He had parked his old, beat-up Ford Pinto in a fire lane along a busy corridor. Out of the cracked back window, an orange extension cord snaked down the sidewalk to a small patch of grass where he stood behind a navy blue plastic chair with a pair of clippers by his feet. It wasn't the prettiest setup, but I hadn't had a haircut in weeks, so I was excited to hop in the chair. I wasn't expecting much from it, but the moment the clippers grazed my head, I felt instant relief. It didn't have any of the familiar sights, sounds, or smells of the barbershop I was used to. No pictures of Muhammad Ali or Malcolm X. No rap or R&B music playing in the background. No soft, sweet smell of barbicide. But it was a barbershop nonetheless. It was about my relationship with my barber. It was about being cared for. I realized how much the barbershop meant to me that whether it was in the back of a woman's salon in Beijing or in the middle of a public park in downtown Oakland, every time I walked through those doors, my soul was nourished. And it was there during that cold and windy haircut in the park that my answer had found me. The barbershop, it hadn't just closed for me, it had closed for all black men, denying us a safe haven at a time when we needed it most. I decided that I was going to reopen that door by starting a mobile barber shop. Inspired, I got to work, conducted industry research and prototyped an app. I interviewed customers and talked to barbers that were ready to get back to work. And then the moment of truth, I needed to purchase the van. I went to the dealership for a test drive and it was perfect. But I, I was petrified. It would cost $150,000 to purchase and convert the van. And I knew that the moment I signed, there would be no going back. The fear, the uncertainty, the doubt, it was immobilizing. I didn't know anything about cutting air. I had never run a business. I didn't even know where I could legally park it. <laughs> but most of all, I think I feared who I would be if I failed. I would no longer be Teray, the up-and-coming young techie on his way to doing great things. No, I would be Ture, the failure, who had wasted his potential and opportunity on a barbershop. But I had decided I was done chasing doors. I remember closing my eyes, taking a deep breath, and signing my name. All the questions and uncertainty remained, but the fear, it evaporated. I was fully committed now, and the only way forward was to get to work. I made a to-do list, find a parking lot, check. <laughs> Build a website, handled, hire a carpenter, done. After a few weeks, I had converted the van, acquired some customers, and actually started a business. The next two years were a crash course in entrepreneurship and life. I had some truly satisfying highs and some surprisingly miserable lows. In the end, the business failed, and I lost every dime that I put into it. But in the process, I gained something much more valuable. That was freedom, 
to stop chasing doors. To be successful, we've all had to chase some doors. There's nothing wrong with it, and sometimes it's required. The problem arises when we chase doors for the sake of the chase. Because chasing doors, well, it's addictive. Our friends and family congratulate us, and they push us to open the next one. We feel a sense of pride and accomplishment in our achievement. Like followers on TikTok or likes on Instagram, the dopamine of opening that next door is so much more appealing than the fear and uncertainty of closing one. So we wait. We tell ourselves we'll open our door later when we have enough money or enough experience. We defer our dreams because that door, it leads to the deepest part of our souls, to a place that we're often too afraid to venture. We're afraid that we won't be able to handle it. We're afraid that we won't like what we find there. We're afraid of who we might be if we fail. But the truth is, when you open that door, that big and scary one that sets your heart on fire, you unlock a new part of your soul that gives you everything you need to find your way. So ask yourself, what door has your name on it? And are you willing to open it?